Hey everyone, Dr. Green here again, and today we are going to talk about integer linear programming, what impacts it have, and how are these ILP models solved and done. So some key concepts here. Uh, basically, we're looking at problems now, and what these problems are going to do is have integer constraints or binary constraints. So integers just mean they have to be a whole number, and binary means they have to be a zero or one value. So that is our integrality condition that they have to be integers. Uh, many times we'll have to solve relaxed versions of these problems. That means problems that are not exactly integers or we'll have to change some things in order to find a solution. Uh, bottom line here is integer linear programs are much more difficult to solve. They're much more con computationally complex. Uh, so we need to be careful about what we're doing. Do note that anything that can be modeled as an ILP can also be modeled as a normal LP or linear program. That means we can just change all the variables to continuous variables and solve the model. This is called solving the relaxed version of the model. Uh, this will give us a bound on the best that we can possibly achieve. Uh, since we have to use whole numbers, that ILP will never be better than our linear program. Some people may also round, but this does run into a problem, right? You may say, well, why can't we round? Why can't we just round up or round down or truncate? Well, which one? That's the first question you have to ask. Which one can you do? Can you do it consistently across all constraints and variables in the model? Would rounding in such a way cause the problem to become infeasible? Um, so these are all the, the problems that we run into. And if you round, is that feasible solution actually optimal or is it just a best guess? All right, so that is a problem. We will also run into a thing that we may look at called stopping rules, where this is how we deal with integer linear programs uh, and when we stop trying to find a better solution. So for instance, we may say that our stopping rule is that you have to be within 10% of our linear program something like that, or 5% or 1%. So it tells the Excel and solver and the computer when to stop searching for a better problem. So we will work through these. Little typo there. Employee scheduling, uh, these are types of problems that apply to integer linear programs. Employee scheduling, capital budging, fixed charge, quantity discounts, contract awards, etc. Uh, covering problems are also an interesting one. This is, you know, how do I, how do I place enough brick and mortar stores in Ohio so that I cover the entire population. Okay, so we're gonna go through a couple of these. I'm gonna give you four examples, well, three examples, really. Uh, the first one will be on this video and I will make two more. So the first example we're gonna go on to is package handling. The package handlers working for Air Express are unionized and guaranteed a five-day work week with two consecutive days off. The base wage for the handlers is $6.55 per week. Because most workers prefer weekends off, those working Saturday and Sunday get a $25 bonus, right? Uh, the number of workers required each day of the week, starting with Sunday, are 18, 27, 22, da, da, da. Okay? So I've actually gone ahead and worked out the wages and everything here. So you'll see we have seven different shifts. Each shift has a different set of days off. Sunday, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, or Saturday and Sunday. Each one gets a different wage, and we have a requirement. So the question becomes, how do we actually model this linear program? Uh, so we have to start thinking a little differently here. Uh, you'll see this will this will change things on you and how the models are built. So the first thing I really want to do is we have our given information. We need to decide what we are deciding. What are our variables? What are our choices? In this problem, we are deciding how many workers are assigned to you know, work during each shift. Uh, so the first thing I am going to do, I am going to take this and scoot it over here out of the way. I'm going to move this down. Uh, let's get this in the place where it should be. I was off by one there. And we will create our column here. We'll call this our workers scheduled column. We'll center that up, and here's where we're going to schedule all of our workers to work. Okay, we're going to give that a nice red border. Okay, so this is what we're deciding here. Uh, we also want to, right, we're looking at minimizing things here. So we're going to put our total value here. We are going to format these cells. We are going to give it a typical black double line border. And this is just going to be the sum product of 
the wages I'm paying to the workers scheduled to work during that shift. Okay, so we're in good shape there. That's pretty easy. Now the hard part is counting the number of workers required. Uh, so the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna take this Sunday through Monday. I am gonna move it right up here. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to look and say, well, you know, shift one has Sunday and Monday off. Monday and Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday, Thursday and Friday, Friday and Saturday. The rest of these are all going to be ones because that's when they are working. So basically what I've done is I've built a matrix up here that consists of ones when people are working on a given shift and zeros otherwise. Okay. Why would I do something like this? Well, I will show you here. I'm going to go ahead, give this our nice formatting as well. Oops. And let's give it some fill. Okay. The reason I'm going to do this is because I have a number of workers required. This is going to be an inequality that says greater than or equal to. I need a certain number of workers. And then we have to figure out how to count. Well, this is actually quite easy. We count this matrix of zeros and ones in a sum product with the number of workers scheduled. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and lock that and pull it across and then I'm gonna show you how that works. Now you see those are formatted as dollars. Well, that's no good. Okay, so say I schedule one worker for this. Check that out, okay? So if I schedule one worker for shift one, that means they're off Sunday and Monday. Zeros. Okay. Let's go back here and just do a quick format number. And we're just gonna make that a general number. Okay, so we have this, you'll see on there is zero people working on Sunday, Monday, and one person working Monday through or Tuesday through Saturday. If I go here and say they have a Saturday and Sunday, right? Uh, and you'll notice I actually made a mistake here. That should be a zero, and that should be a zero. Okay. <clears throat> You'll see that I now have coverage during most of my week here, right? So Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday through there, this is all adding up. Also, everything is adding up over here. Great. So the first thing we want to do is we are going to have our model. We are going to go into Solver, open this up. We're going to clear this out. And we are going to say we are minimizing right across by changing these values such that our total workers for any given day is greater than or equal to the number of workers required okay we're going to do that with our simplex and we should be good to go here okay so let's solve this and see what happens okay get this okay so we have a couple interesting problems here uh, one is we're actually in good shape as far as everything goes, but the thing that causes us the issue is right here. 24.66 people. Um, maybe you are able to do this. I am not. Okay. Uh, this is something that I am definitely not able to do is to schedule 24.66 workers. Okay? I will notice that the other issue is over here. Check out these values. Okay. 1.3 1 and a third workers, 6 and a third workers, 7 and a third workers, and a third of a worker. Uh, now, if you have the ability to schedule part time workers, you may be able to mix that in with this, but in general, this is not something we want to see is this, okay? Um, or I could adjust this problem so that we have full time and part time workers. There's different things to do. But here, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to copy this down. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and paste this. Right? You'll see almost everything stayed, well, almost everything. Uh, I'm gonna do a copy, I'm gonna paste special and put our values in here, okay? I did that so that we can see this is our original linear program. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna go back into Solver and I am gonna add a new constraint. I am gonna say my decision cells have to be integer, I-N-T. Okay. So you actually have these three constraints we have not talked about yet. Integer, binary, which means they have to be zero or one, or diff, which means they have to be all different. 
Uh, so in this case, we're going to say int and just say OK. And we're going to say solve. Now you'll see it's searching through solutions. Solver found a solution. Oh, hey, you'll see our integer linear program, the solution is not as good as our linear program, right? This is going to cost me more money, quite a bit, 22,540 versus 22,103. Uh, but now we have whole numbers of workers. And you'll see there's a difference here. There's a difference here. There's a difference here. There's a difference there. Uh, and there's some differences here, right? 3, 3, 6. 6 was just rounded, obviously. Uh, 7 was rounded, right? 2 instead of 0.3 and 12 instead of 13. So congratulations, you now have completed your first integer linear program. There you go.